Hello, everyone. This is Hiltrude Dawson at the Best Diet Resource Center, and it is exactly 12 o'clock, at least on my computer here it is. And I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, webinar today, for uh, primarily for Healthy Babies, Healthy Children staff. I do see that uh, one or two of you are from other um, organizations as well that are uh, do very related work. So it's for HPHC staff who are working with families uh, with young children. Um, I pleased to see that we have so many on the line. We do did have a full registration. And okay, sorry, that's not the slide I want. Um, okay, we're just. Uh, so we have um, um, slide deck. That will be the slides. No, no, I, I, the slides are coming. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm talking to someone else. <laughs> okay. I thought sorry. it was muted. So yeah. So um, yes. Uh, okay. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm hoping you were able to um, edit your information at the. It shows you how to do that on the slide here, so that you can put in who you are and um, what organization you're from. And if you have more than one person with you, then it would be lovely if we hear that as well. Um, we, your audio, if you can hear through the computer, that's perfect. And um, you don't even need to speak because you're just gonna use the chat line. But if you don't hear that way, then you can use the uh, telephone line and then the participant code is there. And we've just started the audio. And um, I would like to just um, remind you that the Best Side Resource Center is there to help you with things afterwards. If you're looking at um, any of the, uh, the information that our presenter is going to give you on parent-child relationships, and you would like more information, added resources, talk about how you can use that in your work, um, we can help you with that. We can either connect you with others or help you. And uh, I'm going to switch now to our presenter because she's got lots of information um, and a, a busy, or not a busy, but a full slide deck with lots of things to share. Um, our presenter is uh, Dr. Nicole Letourneau. Um, and she is from the University of Calgary. And she has many accolades and many uh, areas that she's involved in. She has been uh, working on maternal mental health for quite some time. Uh, I remember hearing presentations from Nicole uh, quite a few years ago. She's been working on infant mental health, parent-infant-child relationships. She's most recently involved in the child health study. and. Um, I'm going to just making that bigger. Can you all see that? Okay. Um, okay. So um, hopefully you can see all right. And I will hand it over to Nicole. Nicole, you may want to say a few more words about yourself, but I'm going to let you do that. Sure. Hi. Welcome, everyone. It's just a delight to be able to speak with you. Uh, I guess the big thing I wanted to add is that I'm a, a nurse and. Uh, Really proud to be a nurse and doing this work. I think nurses have so much to contribute in this area. And um, I've been doing this work for about 20 years. Can I just carry on from there now, Hiltrude? Yes, yes, please do. OK, terrific. So my title of the talk today is Parent-Infant-Child Relationships and Children's Physiological and Developmental Health. And I'd just like to pause for a moment on the hyphenated parent-infant-child. Um, because I really don't think that we should be considering infants and children's uh, mental health uh, without considering the context of their of relationships with their parents. So that's why my chair is in parent-infant mental health and not parent or infant mental health, because I really think the two are um, uh, intricately intertwined and really need to be considered together when we're really working to try and improve the best uh, uh, environments for children. So I've got a lot of slides, and, um, oh, and lately I have... Uh, come to conclude that I have an attachment disorder to my slides, so I have a very hard time to cut any. I want to share so much information with you, and I will go rather quickly. Um, I may, I will keep an eye on the time, and I may uh, skim over some slides in the interest of making sure we have time for questions at the end, but I really felt like this package of slides, knowing that you would all have them, uh, many of the slides are 
self-explanatory. So if I do skim over some, uh, the information is there for you. And of course, if any of you have any questions after the talk, uh, after this hour, please reach out to me. My email is at the end of the slide deck, and I'm really happy to engage in any conversations that uh, you know will help you in your practice, uh, provide the best environments for parents. So, so, so here we go. Um, buckle in. <laughs> I speak pretty fast. <laughs> so, um, my objectives uh, for the talk that were you know in the contract that was provided to me were the to provide insight into protective factors in parent-child relationships and practical suggestions for how to support parent-child relationships. And uh, the way I'm going to do that is by doing the, the four bullet points. One, provide background. Basically, I'm going to teach you about parent-child relationships. Provide background to attachment and reflective function the same way I teach you about those concepts. And then talk about some of the research that shows uh, how parent-child relationships, attachment, and reflective function relate to outcomes in children. And, uh, I, and the fourth, I'm going to cover is some intervention work that I've done that will give you some suggestions for how to um, use this content in your work. Okay, I keep hitting the wrong button. All right. Um, so first, parent-child relationships. So I draw heavily upon the work of Catherine Barnard, who is a nurse who was practicing in the, you know, she just passed away, unfortunately, but has been a leader and a pioneer in nursing research and to parent-child relationship quality. And she really spoke about the importance of not only the caregiver and the child's characteristics to the parent-child relationship quality, but also the environment, where the resources that are available to those parents to try the best environment for their children, inanimate and animate. And a lot of that uh, is where we come in as um, healthcare providers. We are uh, linking parents with the resources that they need to promote their physical health, their mental health, their coping, and even um, help them attain you know, higher education if they, for example, are a teen parent. And also, uh, we as social you know, uh, support people, nurses, social workers, and others who work with parents also can help parents understand um, the child and how their temperament and physiological uh, characteristics also, um, also um, relate to the interaction quality. So that little purple triangle in the middle really it is uh, the parent infant relationship quality that is established when you consider all of those, those characteristics. And I guess that the key point here is that we are the environment that are supporting the caregivers to have the best relationships and understanding of their children, have the best relationships with their children. And just further on the Barnard's work, um, Barnard spoke about what are the essential characteristics for parents and children to have optimal parent-child relationship quality. And it might um, not be surprising to us now, but it was surprising in the 70s and 80s to speak about how the child had any role to play in the quality of the relationship that the parent could establish with the child. So essentially the parent had some responsibilities, that is to be sensitive to cues of the child, to alleviate the child's distress, so obviously be able to notice those cues of distress and respond appropriately and provide different types of growth fostering situations, social, emotional, and, and cognitive growth fostering situations. So social, emotional are things like gentle touches and uh, um, you know, uh, using a, a, a vocal um, level that's nurturing and uh, you know, making eye contact with the baby and doing the sorts of things that conveys to the child that they're loved and cared for. And the, growth, the, the cognitive growth fostering situations, in contrast, are things like reading to the child, um, describing things with rich language, um, using ex explanatory statements as opposed to declarative statements, that kind of thing. And I think many of you are aware of the, the NCAST, uh, parent-child interaction assessment tools. These, all of these um, concepts are elaborated very well on those tools, which are also developed by Catherine Barnard. And I'll be speaking about those at the end as well. And of course, the infant or child needs to provide um, certain things in order for the parent to be able to respond to them appropriately and, and make for a healthy parent-child relationship, and that's to provide clear cues and respond to the caregiver. So a child, for example, who gives a cue that signals they are in distress, like crying, and parent tries to soothe the child, ideally that child will soothe. They'll respond to the caregiver and soothe. A child who does not soothe, so for example, a colicky baby um, does not respond to the caregiver's soothing attempts, and that is what can create, for example, a break in the interaction. And that's why there's the little breaks in the arrows that go uh, between the caregiver's parent characteristics and the infant child characteristics back and forth. I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, and here's just, uh, I like this slide because it really speaks to how the parent's brain is doing so much. The parent's brain and their, uh, their actions and their interactions between the parent and child are really what are the, what's, what's happening, what's uh, the essential environment that's helping to um, develop the baby's brain. A baby gets almost all of their interaction with the world through the interpretation of their caregiver. Um, a baby will be, you know, for sitting by itself, for example, in a, in a 
swing that the parent put them in. And, uh, um, and as the child is awake, usually parents are uh, interpreting the world for them. And it's when the parent is not there, and then that's when the neglect, you know, when it's chronic, and that's when the neglect happens and the, and the brain of the, of the baby is uh, affected by that lack of, of sensory stimuli and interpretation of the world. So I just wanted to point out how babies' brains develop in the context of relationships between the parent and child. And here's just a, a great example of um, a really nice synchronous interaction. You can see how the, the baby's uh, uh, mouth is wide and open and uh, interested in the, the caregiver with the eyes, the contact, and the caregiver is, is, is uh, demonstrating the same signals right back to the child. The child's uh, arms are raised, signaling a desire to interact. And presumably, if the child looked away, that caregiver would back off a little, maybe not be so intense in the, in the moment and let the child um, recover and then return to the interaction. And that's just an example of a nice synchronous moment, and we hope that that synchrony will, will continue. And I just have these links to, uh, and I, I didn't have time to show them today, but I highly, highly recommend you go to these YouTube links and look at serve and return videos. Um, there's two that I recommend, one by the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative and the other by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And these provide really excellent examples of serve and return relationships as well as how serve and return relationships relate to children's development. And serve and return essentially is the metaphor that's been created to explain the uh, sensitivity and responsiveness of caregivers to their children. So when an infant serves up a cue, the caregiver will return the cue, much like in tennis. If someone hits the ball to you, you should you know, try to return the ball. And then, it, then the uh, original person who hit the ball will try and return it again. And you end up having a nice kind of rally to, to kind of keep the metaphor going. But the idea of serve and return is that parents are able to notice and respond to their infant's serves or cues and return those cues appropriately and to make a nice positive um, interaction that ultimately will relate to the a more positive parent-child relationship quality overall. And I'm happy to answer questions about that uh, and now or later. So just let me know if you have any in the chat. Um, I really love this definition of um, Adult sensitivity, though. So when we speak about serve and return, uh, the adult needs to be sensitive to the child's cues. But in many um, uh, ways, we've spoken about sensitivity in our discipline of nursing, social worker, psychiatry, psychology. We've often ended up with a list of what, what, de what defines a sensitive parent. Oh, okay, someone that makes eye contact, uh, talks to the baby, looks at the baby, that kind of thing. Um, but those list of behaviors may not always be uh, appropriate. Um, so uh, looking at a baby too intensely, for example, as in the, as in the, uh, the um, picture I showed you here, if that child does not want to uh, maintain eye contact because it's difficult to make, maintain eye contact for a long period of time and that caregiver doesn't notice that, that eye contact as a behavior may not be good in that context, may not be ideal in that context. Um, so I love this definition because adult sensitivity in this definition relies on the assessment of the infant. Does the infant like the, the behavior or pattern of the parent? Does the behavior, uh, behavioral pattern of the parent increase the infant's comfort and attentiveness and reduce their distress and their disengagement? So an adult who is able to uh, maintain their child's interest in an activity um, and you can see pleasure of the child in the activity is one who's very likely to be sensitive at a very subtle level to the cues. Now, of course, infants have more, more uh, easy and difficult temperaments, which need to be taken into account here. But in general, I love this definition because it really requires you to not just look at the parent's behavior, but does the child like what's happening in this, in this um, interaction, in this moment? And that suggests that the caregiver is sensitive overall and in, and in the moment. More, more often than not. And to be sensitive, parents need to understand, and we as healthcare providers need to be able to explain this to parents too, that children have states of arousal. We all have states of arousal, but essentially an in infancy of parents is trying to keep the child in a calmly focused and alert state. No one um, loves to have a fussy baby for many hours of the day. Of course, babies become fussy, and the job of the parent is to figure out what the with the difficulty and challenges and either help that child, you know, address the need that's making them fussy and return them to that calmly focused and alert state, or maybe the child is fussy because they need to go to sleep and help the child to, you know, um, go to sleep by reducing the stimuli in the environment and doing things appropriately to help um, be conducive to sleep. So these states of arousal are important for parents to understand. You know, um, particularly, it's difficult for parents to uh, interact with children 
when they're fussy or when they're hypoalert or drowsy. So the best state for parents to um, interact with their children and promote all the development that we hope in the brain um, will happen is during that calming focus and alert state. All right. And infant states can be influenced by stimulation of the baby's environment, as I spoke about. And infant states are also influenced by their own stimulation from within them. So if they're hungry or fatigued or have uh, a pain or fear, those certainly will influence the infant states. And it's the caregiver's responsibility, um, ultimately, to help the child um, and help the child with their internal state regulation because some, you know, they can't feed themselves, uh, they can't put themselves to bed, for example, um, and it's the caregiver's responsibility to also notice things in the environment. So caregivers are the modulators of their infant states, and the thing I will convince you of by the end of this talk is that by so doing, these simple things, caregivers are actually influences, influencing the uh, physiologic regulation of the child, the internal, their, their um, sympathetic uh, nervous system is essentially um, being regulated and modulated by the parent before the child is, is, is um, m you know, mature enough to do it themselves. All right, so a little bit more about infant states. Um, infant responsiveness in each state influences what will occur between the mother and baby. So that goes back to the point I was making about hypoalert, drowsy, for example. And so not, those are not good states for interaction. And so if you're going to try to do something with the baby or young child, teach them to do something that's not the best time, for example. Um, I spoke about the importance of the quiet alert state and how it's the best time for learning from the world and conducive to best interactions with caregivers. And one of the most valuable things from all of the work of Catherine Barnard in the uh, NCAST Institute at the University of Washington, from which a lot of this information is drawn, um, are the infant cues. The infant cues that in, uh, signal the infant is ready to interact or engage, they're called engagement cues, or cues that are signs of stress, cues that suggest the infant needs a break or a change in the interaction. So engagement cues are, um, um, well, they're, in, these, they're engagement cues and disengagement cues that are easier and harder to see. But these, most of them here are easier to see. You know, the wide and bright eyes, reaching towards you, raising up the eyebrows, relaxed, you know, body posture, looking at you. Those are all signs that are pretty uh, easy to see. And, you know, we do that. I to each other as adults. These are not unique to children. Um, regular breathing rate, for example, you might not notice that as an as a engagement cue, but you know yourself when something's stressing you out, your breath rate will increase, your heart rate will increase, and, and uh, the very same things happen in, in babies. And of course, the signs of stress in babies are things like hiccuping, yawning, looking away, back arching, squirming, uh, frantic, um, arms and legs you know, pushed away, or very limp and floppy. Uh, anytime babies are like touching their face, skin, hair, pulling at their clothes, it's, it's usually a sign that they need to break in the interaction. But the other thing I like to point out is, I did not to take any one of these um, uh, as being uh, an overall cue. But any, many, at any given moment, all of us are demonstrating multiple of these cues. So the really sensitive parents and um, and healthcare providers are able to notice that what's the what's the dominant uh, flavor of all these cues. So by noticing and responding appropriately to infant cues, I wanted to point out earlier, and as I said, mothers are regulators of their infant states and underlying physiology. So regulators of infants' endocrine and nervous systems. And I also put this video in here uh, as a link for you to maybe as follow-up homework for yourself. These are really quick videos, uh, easy to watch, two or three minutes. But this is an example of the still face paradigm and how stressed out a baby becomes when their parents have a, a blank face and do not interact with them as they're accustomed to. So now I'm going to speak about attachment and reflective function. And this is not what I mean by attachment. You might have heard of attachment parenting, uh, where parents are afraid to stress their children at all or, or advise not to and you know, co-sleep until the children wants to move out of the bed and that kind of thing. That is not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to um, the idea, uh, the evolutionary idea of attachment, which comes from uh, you know, the early definitions of this uh, concept came from the UK. Um, and John Bowlby and Donald Winnicott. Donald Winnicott was a, a contemporary of John Bowlby, and he said there's no such thing as a baby. And then he went on to say, a ba oh, sorry about it being cut off here. He says, a baby alone does not exist. Exists is under the, the child logo there. Apologies. Um, but the point being that uh, babies cannot live without their attachment figures. It's an evolutionary drive of babies to do things that they need to do in order to keep their caregivers close. So the attachment is an emotional bond to another person. I spoke about John Bowlby. He believed that these earliest bonds have a tremendous impact that continues throughout life. That has been demonstrated, by the way, um, in longitudinal research. And the attachment serves to keep the infant close to the caregiver. 
for their own survival. So it's a systemic theory that focuses on the behavior in context and patterns of communication. It's, as I said, it's evolutionary. And he proposed that inside every individual there are, there are scripts or internal working models that come from our earliest experiences in being cared for as an infant. So an infant that receives consistent caring attention will build an internal working model that allows them to develop a secure base. And these are the concepts in attachment. The caregiver should provide a safe haven. I don't know if you can see my cursor wiggling around here. Um, and, that, uh, uh, and they should also provide a secure base. And I'm just looking to see if anyone's chatting online here. Um, and the child will do things to maintain proximity of themselves to their caregiver, like cry when they are separated from their caregiver. And that proximity will enable the child, you know, uh, over many millennia, uh, so infants, our species, not just unique to our species, but also pr many primates have developed these same systems to maintain proximity to their caregivers so that they will survive. And you probably have seen the circle of security um, graphic before. I'm, I, circle of security is a fine program. I'm not saying one thing or another about the program. I just love this graphic because it really describes to me what it is that a caregiver ought to be doing or to promote uh, a secure attachment of their child to them so that their child will go on and have their best uh, mental health and, and development. So the caregiver needs to provide a secure base and a safe haven in the, in the face of distress. The caregiver should watch over them, delight in the child, help them, enjoy with them, and, and the child should feel comfortable going back to the caregiver when there's something that's distressing or novel in the environment like a dog or a new toy or something. And the caregiver, I think it's a nice point here, is that the caregiver should organize the child's feelings. And that goes back to the physiological state regulation that the parents um, do, I was speaking of earlier. So there are four different attachment patterns that we've been able to uh, observe through uh, separations and reunions of babies with parents. Um, and there's so the types A, B, C, and D. And type B infants are considered to be securely attached. But which pattern the child demonstrates in something called the strange situation procedure, which is what we use to assess, assess a child's attachment pattern, um, it reflects whether the children feel confident, safe, and secure in the availability and responses of their caregivers. And these are just the proportions of the different types, in case you're interested. For, type D is linked to psychopathology. And like, luckily, that one is very which is one of the lowest. And here's just a, a graphic of the strange situation procedure. That there's eight segments that happen in that procedure. And I've kind of blown up the graphic for um, in the subsequent slides here. But essentially, we put a child with their caregiver in a strange situation. It's meant to feel like a waiting room in a doctor's office or something. And the child is just playing on the floor. We introduce a stranger. That's the, uh, uh, the second panel on the left. And then the mother leaves the room, and the child is left with a stranger, and we watch to see how the child is with the stranger. And then the mother comes back. We wait to see how the child reacts to the mother. And if I go to my next slide, uh, we um, separate the, uh, we ask the mother to leave the room. And then the child is left alone for a, a moment. And then the stranger comes back in. And then the, and, and we look to see how the child is with the stranger. And then the, finally the mother returns. And we look to see how the child is with the mother. And here's um, a video of the strange situation procedure. If you'd like to watch it, it's an excellent video. But essentially, um, we, those reunions and separations enable us to determine if the child is securely attached to their caregiver. A child who is had a, a sensitive and responsive caregiver so far in their life, life is one that is able to go to their caregiver when they return for comfort from their distress they, that they experienced when they were separated. The caregiver is the solution to the, to the child's problem, which is the separation from the parent. So they go to the caregiver, they get a hug, they stop crying, or they get reassured, and they go back to play. And a secure child is able to go on and explore the environment. Um, that caregiver is providing that safe haven uh, for the child. An infant's attachment pattern B predicts security in adulthood, healthier adult relationships with peers throughout childhood, adolescence, and even adult um, intimate relationships. And it promotes children's social emotional development, positive behaviors like resiliency and curiosity, self-reliance, self-regulation, social competence in adulthood, and overall positive mental health. And in contrast, insecure attachment predicts externalizing behavioral problems, uh, internalizing behavioral disorders like anxiety and depression, cognitive and language deficits, and what is most interesting to me, uh, rec well, it's not that recent now, but 2013, Puig and colleagues produced a study uh, looking at this attachment pattern in age one year of age and uh, adult disease at 30 years of age with the same children, and found that if children were insecure at age one, they were more likely to have inflammatory disorders and all-cause disease at age 30. So um, quite a profound study. And what happens when, so just to describe what happens with the type A and type C children, when their parents return to the 
re, when they reunite with the children in a strange situation procedure, the type A children have learned that um, their feelings are not co going to be comforted and there's no point in displaying them often. It's kind of a sad thing, but you see the child not even uh, notice that the caregiver has returned, or they might just look at their caregiver and continue on with their play. And their play is less than optimal. They're, they're really not engaged with the environment. If you actually put some um, physiological data measurement tools on them, like heart rate monitors and that kind of thing, you'll see these children are very stressed in the interaction when they're separated from their caregiver and when their caregiver returns, but they do not display those those emotions. And type C children are just the opposite. Um, when their caregivers return, they're angry at them, they're displaying their emotions, and they may hit their caregiver, they may struggle to get in the caregiver's arms and then struggle to get down and, and then back and forth. And these children are often, uh, this, this strategy often develops because caregivers are unreliably responsive. Sometimes they respond and sometimes they don't. So the children have learned that um, uh, they, the, the best way to get a response is to really ramp it up, and so that's what they do. And attachment disorganization, disorganization is when children are unable to really marshal a response. They do odd behaviors in the, during the interaction and during the reunion, and the clapping arms or um, going to the stranger for comfort, um, that kind of thing. Um, and disorganized attachment is uh, often comes from situations where the primary caregivers are affected by toxic stress themselves. They may be traumatized, depressed, or distressed. Uh, and they're unable to regulate their own distress, let alone their infant's distress. And um, in the case of abuse, abusers are unlikely to provide environmental conducive to safety and security. You know, so these children are unable to get safe haven from their caregivers who are abusive. So it, um, it's understood to result in a disorganized attachment. And some of the things that we know linked to disorganized attachment are things like threatening behaviors and the caregiver looming to the child, um, which is might seem. Um, it might not seem like such a bad thing, but if you imagine you're a helpless infant and someone looms in on you all the time, it can be kind of uh, uh, threatening. A dissociative, so it's when parents are really not in the moment. They're, you know, um, have a haunted voice or they're very deferential or timid with the child. They're afraid of the child. You know, their behavior suggests that they're un, uh, uh, they're, they're lacking confidence in their child care. Um, Disrupted would be failure to repair um, interaction errors, like laughing at a child's crying, and I mean, that's the worst, actually. That's the effective communication error. But if uh, a caregiver might say, oh, mommy didn't mean to do that, and then try not to do that again, um, uh, those sorts of things. Or if mother it was, or father, you know, these, I, let's talk about maternal here, by the way. I could have a big, long, qualifying statement about how this is any primary caregiver, although most of the time we recognize in our society it's, it's moms. But these relationships are not unique to moms. They're unique to primary caregivers and attachment figures. So um, I hope that gives you a sense of some of the, the parental anomalous behaviors that seem to link to disorganized attachment. And disorganized attachment, as I said, is the one that's most strongly linked to um, the psychopathologies. And I love this graphic because it really speaks to um, how it is that caregivers need to function in order to promote secure attachment. So when the child experiences distress or fear, it activate that's the top blue box. It should activate their attachment system, and they should go seek comfort from their caregiver, and their caregiver should inter uh, intervene and help down regulate the child's emotions. But a caregiver who um, so care, that requires the caregiver to recognize their child's distress and thus regulate their own distress. But if they have had a traumatic um, childhood or upbringing or some kind of recent trauma even, uh, they may be unable to uh, regulate their own distress in the face of the child's distress. Like for example, crying when the child is crying. That's scary for the child and uh, the child is unable to, um, to, to identify and, and have that reliable safe haven. Now I want to speak about parental reflective function. So parental reflective function strengthens the parent-child relationship and it underpins parental sensitivity. Essentially, it was believed to support child development and is um, believed to uh, be important in the role of the transmission of attachment through the generations. But what is it exactly? Um, the ability of a parent, uh, with high, a parent with high reflective function is able to uh, imagine the thoughts and feelings of their child. And you can imagine that if you are, in order to be sensitive, you have to have a sense. You have to be able to be, imagine what that child might be thinking or feeling. And they also need, you also need to perceive the influence of your emotions on your child's mental states. So going back to um, this bit here, 
the caregiver needs to regulate their own distress in order to help down regulate the child's emotions. And this is what is, is uh, an important aspect of reflective function. So the caregiver needs to be able to have insight into their own thoughts and feelings, how that might, those might affect the child, and insight, of course, into the child's thoughts and feelings. And parental reflective function is associated with infant attachment security, and in turn, attachment security is associated with healthy child development. So, um, you know, we're, actually we're saying this ourselves, but we're um, quite con convinced that uh, parental reflective function underpins healthy child development through the quality of attachment. So what are the outcomes associated with altered parent-child relationships? And I spoke a little bit already about what interferes with parent-child relationships, and it's really the toxic stressors, mental health problems, family violence, maternal addictions. These are considered the toxic stressors, also attachment and trauma history. And uh, just to give you a quick primer on toxic versus other types of stress, this is a lot of this um, stuff I use draws from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And it's, I want to point out that stress is not bad as a rule. It's, to it's toxic stress that's bad as a rule. Um, but what's important for us as uh, healthcare providers working with families is that the these social support, the protective relationships that we can help build either through our supportive interactions with caregivers or helping parents have healthier interactions with their babies can take a toxic stressor and make it tolerable. So toxic stressors are only toxic because they're prolonged activation of the stress response in the absence of protective relationships. So a caregiver who's got mental health issues, unable to be sensitive and responsive to their child, that is considered a toxic stressor, stressor to children's development. But we know very well that if social supports are provided to moms to help them with their postpartum depression or their mental health issue, we're very much able to protect that, um, that, that child from toxic stress because that toxic stress may turn to a tolerable stress and eventually go away. And so sensitivity and parental availability are key determinants of secure attachment. I think that's a key point that um, I've mentioned quite a bit already. But now I'm going to speak a little bit about outcomes. So how does, uh, how does maternal depression and re affect reduce maternal sensitivity and responsiveness and then ultimately uh, reduce maternal child attachment quality? So depressed moms, have, um, because of the symptoms they experience, are less good interactive partners. And they even interpret some of the normal behaviors of their infant in a negative way. So a crying baby who, uh, you know, a mom who's not depressed uh, would interpret as a baby who just needs some attention, would be interpreted intentionally as a mom with depression as a baby who's just a small brat and won't leave me alone. Um, and again, I am speaking in generalities. Um, and what do we know about how depression affects attachment? So if you look at these, these graphics, you see the purple or sort of a wine-colored type B pie. So in non-depressed uh, mother-infant dyads, um, you see 70% of the children are secure versus only 20% of the children are securely attached to caregivers um, who are depressed. And the same pattern plays out in preschool age. So 43% of um, children in Teddy's work uh, were found to be securely attached in non-depressed uh, mother-child dyads versus only 13% in depressed dyads. And the parent-child interaction um, alterations is thought to be the reason why that's the case. Now, let's talk about infant cortisol alterations and how um, reduced parental sensitivity and responsiveness associated with parental stress like postpartum depression um, affects child development through the stress response system of the child. So speaking a bit more to the toxic stress, um, um, how it is that postpartum depression is considered a toxic stressor to children's development. So we know that postpartum depression reduces child developmental outcomes. And we also know, uh, just uh, unfortunately, that even when mother child uh, even when mothers are no longer depressed, there's alterations in the parent-child interaction quality. Uh, that persists because the child is learned to interact with the caregiver who's depressed. When mothers no longer depressed, they don't suddenly change their relationship style. The relationship seems to persist, and that's how we believe um, the maternal infant relationship quality predicts child development over the long term. And I spoke a little bit about the importance of maternal child interaction and self regulation, but caregivers need to regulate baby states. And if caregivers are depressed, they're not able to do this effectively often. And I just to give you a quick primer on cortisol and how, um, just so that you can understand the slides to follow. Um, we all produce cortisol. It comes in a diurnal rhythm, which means that it's higher in the morning and then drops down over the day. And exposure to stress stressors, in the case of a child to a mother with depression, it stimulates more production of um, cortisol from the hypothalamic to adrenal axis, and they 
um, are, well, you'll I'll see in a moment, they end up with more cortisol circulating in their body over the day. And cortisol is neurotoxic, so think about that. If you have chronically elevated cortisol, it's fine in small doses that enables you to respond to stressors, mar, you know, marshal the fight or flight response, but chronically, chronic exposure um, is considered to be neurotoxic and also negatively affects other body systems. Um, and uh, uh, for the baby whose brain is growing and the neurons are proliferating and, um, and joining up, you know, uh, that's bad to be um, de destroying brain cells at a time when they should be proliferating and, and making those connections uh, to establish their foundation for life. And this is just essentially a graphic of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. There's a stressor and it produces metabolic effects, the fight or flight, and then as the cortisol increases, it should feed back to downregulate the system. Um, Cortisol is naturally, it, it, there's a natural feedback to cortisol and that at high levels it should feed back and, and downregulate the entire system. And um, parents are supposed to be helping children to help downregulate as well by reducing the source of the stress. So I spoke a little bit about um, some of these issues around brain development. So if you have too much cortisol, it decreases brain volume and inhibits uh, neuronal um, production uh, and ultimately neuronal plasticity, so the flexibility of the brain to um, adapt in future and abnormal synaptic connectivity. So too much cortisol predicts predict fear behaviors, hypervigilance in children. It's reduced to, uh, linked to reduced cognition, memory, attention, self-control, behavior problems, as you can imagine, because the brain is affected. And um, it also relates to uh, changes in other body systems, so not surprisingly increased insulin resistance, obesity, and immune changes, and so on. Um, we see changes in, uh, directly related to depression. So infants, three-year-olds, and um, school age and adolescent children uh, have altered cortisol patterns when their mothers are depressed. And the more months of um, exposure to depression, the more, the more increased uh, changes there are to the cortisol levels. And this is just, a, if you're interested, this is a citation uh, of the article that we published on cortisol patterns of depressed mothers and their infants. And we wanted to know, did the maternal child interaction quality help downregulate the child's um, uh, exposure to stress when their mothers are depressed? So in, in other words, mothers were depressed in this study. All 53 mothers were depressed. But we also assessed the quality of sensitivity and responsiveness they had with their children or serve and return relationships they had with their children uh, to see if that might explain some of the variability in uh, children whose mothers are depressed. So not all children uh, do poorly when their mothers are depressed. And we wondered if that had something to do with the quality of maternal child interaction. And I'll just tell you, yes, it did. <laughs> so uh, while the infants are depressed, mothers produce more cortisol than the norm. It wasn't how depressed the mothers were that made the difference. It was how sensitive and responsive they were to their infants. And essentially, mothers who were less sensitive and responsive had infants with higher cortisol over the day. And I showed you how that was neurotoxic. And that is how we explain the, the behavioral and um, other uh, uh, cognitive and physiological outcomes of children exposed to mothers with depression. But in general, mothers who were less sensitive in this example, they, were, they, um, they played with, talked to, made eye contact, touched, and praised their children less. So you see, um, so I told you about how the, the, uh, the pattern of cortisol in people, children included, should be high in the morning, which it was, and then drop down over the day. And you see the moms in our sample had that pattern. The children's cortisol levels were elevated in the afternoon because their mothers were all depressed. Um, and this essentially just shows that we were able to demonstrate a reduction in the decrease in cortisol due to social-emotional growth below average. So essentially, mothers who were providing social-emotional growth-fostering activities um, were pr um, reducing their children's levels of cortisol over the day. Uh, similarly, mothers who provided a higher uh, cognitive growth-fostering activities. And this all comes from the NCAS tool that I mentioned at the beginning. We'll talk to you more about it at the end, and I think many of you are familiar with. But essentially, the, the data from the NCAS tool on teaching showed us that uh, it was the quality of parent-child interaction in that, as, as assessed by that tool that predicted reduced cortisol levels in the babies who were, uh, of mothers who were depressed. And so we actually had many other variables in that study. We looked at how depressed the moms were. We looked at their difficult life circumstances, how satisfied they were in their relationships, their, their income level, um, and whether the children were born preterm, had birth complications, had spent time in an ICU, and even their temperament. And, oh, Okay, it's not falling away as it should, but that's fine. Basically, what I would love this slide to show you is that only the parent-child interaction quality predicted cortisol levels. Nothing else did.
only the parent-child it wasn't depression severity it was only the parent-child interaction quality so I'm very comfortable saying that mothers and fathers are hidden regulators of their infants endocrine and nervous systems via parent-child relationship qualities and just to talk to you a bit more about some other research that we've done on atopic disease it's asthma atopic disease of the skin uh, includes things like skin conditions and uh, other inflammatory disorders we published this paper if you'd like to try and find it on maternal sensitivity and social support, how it protects against childhood atopic dermatitis. But essentially, atopic dermatitis is part of the atopic march uh, from inflammatory skin conditions that you see in infancy. You don't diagnose asthma in infants, but you can diagnose uh, inflammatory skin conditions, which tend to follow, to, uh, tend to be followed by allergic rhinitis, so runny nose kind of thing, chronic runny nose, to asthma. And so in our research, we looked at atopic dermatitis in infants at 18 months of age, and we looked to see how mothers were interacting with their children. Um, at six months of age to see if we could predict uh, an immune reaction from early relationships. And we did find that. We found that mothers who are sensitive in our samples, was using a different measure, of, but again, an observational tool of maternal-child interaction. If mothers were sensitive, they, almost none of them had atopic dermatitis. The sample was about 240. We had about 40 kids who had atopic dermatitis, and those were the kids whose mothers had at-risk style uh, interactions with them. They were less sensitive, um, more controlling, and more unresponsive. And we also found just that social support actually helped. So I just like to point that out, the kind of social support that mothers got, um, not just from their partners, but from healthcare providers like us, also reduced the incidence of atopic dermatitis in this context. And there's also some um, uh, indication that the, the depression that moms had increased the, and, and anxiety that they had increased the child's likelihood of atopic dermatitis. But it's really important to note that one of the strongest predictors is how sensitive the mothers were to their children. And this is just data showing the controlling and unresponsive patterns as well. So now I'm going to go on to intervention research. This is the NCAS teaching scale I think many of you are familiar with. And I love this because it maps on exactly to Barnard's model, which I spoke to at the beginning. The first, the front side is the mother characteristics, the back side are the infant characteristics of the teaching scale and the feeding scale. And I think they're terrific tools. And the typical NCAST intervention is where interventions will teach parents concepts relevant to NCAST. The interventions will observe the parent in an NCAST teaching and or feeding interaction, and usually multiple of those over, over more than one visit. The interventions can provide feedback using video or in-person observation, focusing on strengths and one or two areas for improvement. And then the parent is asked to redo the teaching or feeding interaction after the feedback. And then typically, in many studies now, post-test examinations reveal improvement. And this is one example of a project that took part in quite a long time ago. It was a group intervention for depressed mothers and their infants. And uh, essentially, um, it was me. I was the interventionist back in my master's. That's how long ago it was, or maybe early PhD. Anyway, direct group instruction given to mothers with depression, postpartum depression. We taught the NCAS keys to caregiving concepts. Those are infant states, infant behaviors, uh, state modulation, importance of feeding, those sorts of things. Uh, we taught them in five weekly sessions beginning at three months of infant age. We videotaped the dyads, mother-child dyads, pre and post. And we taught them to use the still face paradigm to see um, as, a, as a way to determine the effectiveness of intervention. And then we coded those. And essentially, we saw that the children who, uh, compared to their pretest scores, they were much more um, uh, they were much more upset, essentially, in the still face paradigm with their parents' lack of emotion, you know, that the blank face that the parent had to do during the still face paradigm than they were at the beginning. So we, we saw that as a, a strong signal that the intervention actually did work because the children became accustomed to a new, a new more interactive parenting style. And then this is another study. This was done in my doctorate, improving adolescent parent-infant relationship or interaction. Sorry, a pilot study, and we did some follow-up work on this. But essentially, it was an intervention delivered at home. Again, it was by me back in the day, and um, we provided six weeks of, uh, of instru I provided six weeks of instruction using the Keys to Caregiving program, teaching those concepts I mentioned already. And uh, long story short, you see all these p-values on every like on total scores on the end feeding scale. Uh, and parent and total score, sorry, parent scores on the feeding scale, total parent-child contingency scores on the teaching scale. These are post-intervention outcomes. I didn't do any baseline because it was too stressful for the teen moms to be assessed like right after birth. But here's the, the story. These are all the outcomes that we found significant differences um, between the treatment and control group on the quality of interaction. Essentially, the intervention program worked very well to promote parent-child interaction quality between teen mothers and their babies.
And then we have a new program called VidKids, um, Video Interaction Guidance Centers with Pulse and Depression in the Infants. We're testing it in partnership with um, Calgary Public Health. Um, I'm very excited about this program. Uh, it's a professional in-home guidance over th only three one-hour sessions. We use video playback of mother-child interactions delivered by nurses. So we really feel it's important for nurses to be delivering uh, the, the video feedback content. And our pilot study uh, of only 12 uh, results, you know, resulted in really strong, significant differences and um, and the, the funding to uh, of you know $700,000 or so to test this program with Calgary Public Health. I'll show the results in a moment, but here's just so you get a sense of what we're doing. The, in each session with the parent, the nurse uh, videotapes the parent um, with the child, um, the videotapes the mother with the child, and then the nurse looks at the video to get a sense of what she needs to talk to the mom about. Then the mother and the nurse look at it together, and then the third viewing is the mother and the nurse, or, or mother's giving, sorry, the nurse is giving the mother feedback um, and talking about the baby cues. And, and then the fourth viewing is the, the serve and return feedback. I'm looking at one of my interventions who's sitting here with me right now listening in. And I think we might have even reduced this to three. Have we sometimes? Yes. Yeah. So because some of the, the RN independent viewing can happen with RN and mother viewing. But anyway, uh, long story short, we're really feeling very positive about this program. The pilot data showed significant differences on um, not depression scores, but we think that might be due to the sample size. This is a, a, this is a pretty good effect size. The 0.42 is a pretty good effect size. Um, and we think with a larger sample, we'll even see differences in depression. But the key thing is here, p-values less than 0 0.05 are very awesome, <laughs> to, say the way, to make it uh, plain. And we found parent-child interaction improved compared to the control group. And we found infant cortisol levels declined significantly in the treatment group compared to the control group. And the last one I just want to tell you about, and maybe you'll invite me back to talk to you about this later, but we have this new intervention model called the ATTACH uh, program. ATTACH stands for Attachment and Child Health. And essentially, we're trying to help parents improve their reflective function. And we think this could be done in, in conjunction with lots of other parenting programs that don't currently address this issue, including our VidKids program, for example. Um, but essentially, our program is designed to help parents develop a realistic representation of their child. So help them to develop high reflective function. Help them to, to practice to have insight into their child's thoughts and feelings, talk about what they think their child's thinking and feeling, and talk about how they think their thoughts and feelings are affecting their child to promote high reflective function, which in turn should promote sensitivity to child cues and child attachment security and ultimately healthy relationships and feedback intergener intergenerationally. So we're testing this program right now. And um, I just wanted to point out, I've been doing a lot of talks with many of you in Ontario, and uh, one of the things that came out frequently was that can we use these Canadian, can we use the NCAST parent-child interaction teaching and feeding scales in Canada because they've been normed on American samples? Well, you inspired me uh, to work with Monica Oxford and my other colleagues here at University of Calgary, but Monica is from the NCAST Institute, University of Washington, and I was inspired to work with her to uh, take all these studies I've been, I, some of which I alluded to here and other studies I haven't, but to determine if, in fact, the Canadian, we can use Canadian samples, um, we can develop, sorry, normative data for Canadian samples, and if the data on American samples is applicable to our Canadian samples. And long story short is the answer is yes. And I recommend you pull this paper from PubMed or Google Scholar or whatever, and uh, it'll uh, make the case for you. Essentially, we have Canadian data on Indigenous parents, low-income parents, somebody affected by violence and depression. And we have new data on a normative community sample from the University of um, Calgary. And um, essentially, we, uh, were, we were able to make the argument from that paper and the work that we did to create that paper that the US 10th percentile cutoffs for Caucasians are sufficient to use in Canada. And, um, and essentially, all of the, the NCAST uh, norms are appropriate for use in Canada. And if you want more nuanced understanding, certainly have a look at that paper. And just to wrap up here, I'd like to include this graphic because for me it kind of summarizes everything I've spoken about. Um, the risk factors to children's um, development in the end are parental uh, depression and family violence addictions, which are the considered to be the toxic stressors. The protective factors that we can build in for parents include high quality parent infant interaction, less social support, reflective function, that combine different attachment security, and ultimately will predict their developmental and physiological health for children. And I didn't go on uh, a lot. I just spoke about cortisol levels, atopic dermatitis um, as part of the atopic merge, but there's plenty of data showing other systems as well that I, I said couldn't include today. So here's my key takeaways. Um, 
uh, with respect to scientific understanding, mothers and fathers are regulators of their infant's behavior, mental and physical health, via hidden influences on their endocrine nervous systems through the parent-child relationship. So we can't underplay the importance of the, of the early parent-child relationship. And in terms of nursing practice, the NCAS teaching and feeding scales and the NCAS concepts, um, like infant states and, and state modulation and whatnot, are terrific ways to assess and intervene to promote healthy parent-child relationships and ultimately child health and NCAS norms are appropriate for use in Canada. And I don't get paid by NCAS for saying any of this stuff, by the way. I just am a fan of the, of the work. And if you want to know more, just, I, you can follow me on Twitter. Feel free to email me about anything you have to chat about. And I just have to point out I've got a couple of books which, um, which really get at a lot of what I have spoken about here today and a lot of other stuff too. And now I'm done. So wow. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. That was just incredible. You packed so much information into such a short time. The good news is we have this webinar recorded. So for anyone who wants to go over any of that again, hear it again, um, it is there. Also, the slides are there. So if you look down on your right um bottom corner there you see files and it says two um, the first one there is the HBHC presentation handout so if you didn't receive it uh, in your email this morning then you can download it from there and um, take a look at the slides there were tons and tons of great resources mentioned and I think it'll be really worthwhile going back to them. Please type in your questions in the chat box in the meantime because we do have about 10 minutes left for questions and I see there's one question there already. And uh, while others are, are, are muting or typing, I'm going to start with that question for um, for Nicole, so do you recommend any good books around attachment for professionals? So not for parents. Um, like yeah, well, parents. yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I don't recommend books on attachment parenting. So I just want to say that. they seem to have a flimsy scientific base. So I just want to point that out, and I, I think there's enough confusion around the concept. But if you really want to understand um, attachment, I would start with uh, uh, Bowlby's books. Um, he's, there's a new reprint of uh, it's called Attachment. Came out in 2008. He started writing about this in the 50s. But really, if you want to have the the, the best, most um, scientifically valid uh, understanding of attachment, anything by Bowlby. And the nice thing is, if you go on Amazon, I mean, I'm just speaking about how it works for me. If you go on Amazon and you d you look for that book, there'll be other titles that come up. And, uh, you know, there's so many books, so I, I think that's probably the best way for you to maybe uh, identify some other uh, selections that would meet your needs. But the thing to stay away from is the attachment parenting stuff. Mm -hmm. And then we have your two good books that are, uh, you, you listed here, The Scientific Parenting and What Kind of a Parent Am I? And I do talk about attachment, yeah. yeah. And I do talk about attachment in both of them, and there are reference lists in, in my books, so... Certainly, that would be a good way as well. And they're not very expensive. I just want to say, if you get these on Amazon, they're like ten dollars each or something, um, as an ebook. I think they're a little bit more in print, twenty bucks, twenty bucks or something. Um, but you know, there's lots of great books out there. And mm -hmm. I would start with Bowlby. Okay. So we have a couple more questions. Would it be possible to send the video links, as the font is very small and difficult to read? So maybe. Um Maybe, Nicole, you could send them to me and I can send them out when I send out the uh, link to the recording. Yeah, sure. That would be awesome. Sure. I could probably read sure. them. I can probably pull them off the slides. So that's you don't even need to. Oh, okay, great, great. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's a question from Cornwall. For caregivers who are reluctant to participate in the NCAS PCI assessment, what message would you think is important for them to hear? Um, that's a really good question. Well, when we approach these parenting uh, assessments, we are also trying to, what we're really trying to do is identify their strengths, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's an opportunity for parents to really find out. It, it, they don't, and you could even say, you know, we don't give, uh, we get, don't get many chances as a parent to get positive feedback, and that's what you're going to get from me. You're definitely going to get um, some positive feedback about some things that you might not even be aware of or, or that you're doing that are great. Mm -hmm. So let's, that, that's an important place to start. 
and that's an important place to you know you just don't go and assess and start giving all kinds of feedback. I, I'm sure your your um, professionals who are on this call have training in how to provide gentle feedback, gently constructive feedback. You always start with positives and they're, and you finish with positives and and the way we um, do these assessments optimally is to, you know, the sandwich method, right? You start with lots of positives, you offer something as a suggestion they might like to try, and you might even write these things down for them, and then you would end with something else that they were doing is really great. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but uh, in approaching parents, I would definitely speak about how they're going to definitely hear about some things that they're doing great that they didn't even maybe think of. Um, and then you use that to, to give them the constructive comment. Mm -hmm. So just uh, as a little explanation, because we have a question here, where can we find the NCAS PCI assessment that um, the webinar, as it is more so for healthy babies, healthy children staff, and I think that's what most of the uh, participants online are there, and most health units in Ontario have purchased um, the scales because unfortunately and cast material are not free they have to be purchased yeah. but the healthy babies healthy children staff in Ontario many of them are trained in using these and I was so happy to see um, in your slides Nicole that this is a such a positive impact that can have I know um, that in Ontario and I'm sure in other places we often struggle with parents are so overwhelmed by so many adverse factors but so many difficult um, circumstances in their lives and we think oh my goodness I can't fix anything here you know what can I do there's this one thing that you can do is that parent infant relationship build that that's such a key piece I was so encouraged seeing that in your slides I think that's what my biggest take-home message here that that was the one thing that made a big difference um, I don't know what to say to those of you who can't access it but you can purchase the things or you could maybe talk to your local public health unit and see if they could share any of that information there's also some um, information in some of other resources and encouraging parents and using that sort of positive feedback um, it's in some of our best start resources so if you have more questions on that please send me an email that would be great so a couple more questions um, the second part of that from Cornwall was how to convey the importance of PCI in the midst of their depression so how can we do that yeah yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, parents might have heard that um, their depression puts their children at risk. And I think, and, and I don't know if that, that's what you're speaking of, you're kind of, they, they're coming to you with that assumption, uh, that, you know, that understanding, and they're feeling bad about that already, um, which is truly really unfortunate. But what, what I can, what I have done is, uh, it's, not their, it's not the symptoms that make the difference. It's, it, it's how they're able to interact with their child. In the, in the midst of depression that makes a difference. So it can be an empowering thing for parents to know that uh, if they can maintain or keep building on the parent-child relationship quality, their depression is very unlikely to have an impact on their child. Mm. So I, can, I use that as an opportunity to say, you know, yes, this, this depression is, is horrible. And we know, on, in general, um, it has negative impacts on children, but we also know that what can make the difference is, is your ability to, to keep and maintain and promote your relationship with your child. So you can use that as, a, as an energizing kind of way of um, engaging with them around learning and, and building upon their sensitivity and responsiveness because that, it's not the depression that's important, that's what my paper showed, it's how well they're able to engage with their baby. And the other thing is, if they're not able, like the other thing, I hate to make people feel bad. I, I'm always so conscious of that when I'm working with mothers with depression. You know, they've got so much on their minds already. Um, but if they're not able to maintain that relationship or build on it because their symptoms are so severe, other people can step in and build that relationship with the child. It's not always about the mom. It's about who is the primary caregiver at the time. And uh, dad, uh, grandparent, Somebody else, somebody who is going to be sensitive and responsive to that baby is is what it needs what needs to happen. And when mom's able and feeling better again, she can also be that sensitive and responsive person. But if she's not able to do it, if she's not able to use that as a, an energizing 
uh, activity in the in the midst of her depression as she's recovering, then someone else in the environment um, uh, should be. Mm -hmm. So I hope it that definitely helps. does. Um, and there's another question from Kelly. Uh, what are your thoughts on using the pipe activities to support parents in their relationship with their children? I think they're also part of NCAR. Yeah, and no, I haven't read the book. I read the pipe manual. It was a couple of years ago, so I vaguely remember it. But I got, you know, it was, it, I do recall the sort of tone of them was it really about supporting parents to. Um, do certain activities that are going to promote their children's development, and and so absolutely, I think that they are they're terrific, and um, and and fit right, the bill very well. Right. And then I just wanted to remind P, uh, every all the participants there too that um, the Best Start Resource Center does have courses for healthy babies, healthy children. Right, they have, we have five online courses, and uh, I think two or three of them are based on some of the NCAST materials. So if you need any extra. Um, you know, training there or a review of some of those, then please go to the courses as well and and um, yeah, just check them out and get the extra learning you need from those. So I think that's all the questions. I'm seeing quite a few thank yous there. And Nicole, that was just awesome. Uh, just an excellent presentation. I see there was a lot packed into a short time. I think we'll all need time to digest and go back to it. So hopefully we'll can find that time in our busy days, but the link will be available for quite some time. I will send it out as soon as I have it ready. At the same time, I will send out a link to our evaluation because we like to make sure that we meet your needs and to do that, you know, if you've got any feedback, We'll re try to respond to that. Um, I also want to say that we have started doing um, a three-month follow-up evaluation, so you will be getting that probably uh, early in January rather than right at Christmas, which it would put us three months will put us right there. I'm not going to send it out on Boxing Day, I don't think. <laughs> um, so anyway, I look forward to hearing from you. And if you've got any feedback, that'll be great. And if you need pointers to any resources, any other help, please let us know. Thank you. And just again, a really big thank you to Nicole. Thanks. Thank yeah, you for having me. It's a pleasure, pleasure having you. Take care. Okay, bye bye. Right, bye With now. That, we're finishing the webinar for today. Okay, thanks yeah, again, uh, uh, Nicole. That was really awesome. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in Le responsable a quitté la conférence. La conférence prendra fin dans 5.